This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. كله كفوا أحد ونشهد أنك أرسلت إلينا رسلا مبشرين ومنذرين لأن لا يكون للناس على الله حجة بعد الرسل ونشهد أنك ختمت الرسالة بسيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد كلما ذكره الذاكرون وكلما غفل عن ذكره الغافلون أما بعد It's always a hard act to follow Sheikh Irfan Very few people that have the art of turning two minutes into five but for whatever it's worth, inshallah, we continue where we left off last week. We were discussing the issue of imama. And in the course of our discussion, in our first lecture, we discussed the nature of the concept of imama. From last week onwards, we started discussing imama in light of the Qur'an in order to see does, that, does the Qur'an give any credence, any foundations, any basis to a belief such as Imama. Tonight we go on to the first of those ayat which are often used by the Shia to support the idea of the divinely appointed Imam of Sayyidina Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu. However, last week in our question and answer session there was a question that stood out. And for whatever it's worth, I thought to pay some attention to that particular question because it is somewhat niggling and you might find it somewhere there at the back of your mind, not adequately dealt with. A brother posed the question that some time ago Barack Obama spoke in Cairo and he was applauded. And an attempt was made by the questioner, some or the other, to make a connection between what is happening in this masjid here in Saudi state now and what is transpiring at a much higher geopolitical level elsewhere in the world. Well, you and I might be well aware of the fact that we wouldn't invite it here by any U.S. State Department or anyone else. We know for ourselves the reason why we are here. At the same time, we take cognizance of the fact that internationally certain things are happening. Between nation states, there are various tensions. And what is being done at the ground level might not directly be related to it, but might somehow or the other be seen or interpreted to have a connection somehow or the other. The point is that there exists a certain need and that need is for the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah to acquaint themselves and get clarity and knowledge for themselves as to what is the Shia all about, what is Shiism. Now, if we go back 30 years when Shiism first raised its head in South Africa, at that time if we had done something of this nature, then it would have been said to us that it is not the time. Because right now the Iranian revolution is going on, it is the first of its kind, it's a unique event in history, so don't do this kind of event right now, wait for a while. Thereafter, if somewhere by the mid-80s we wanted to do something of this kind, you'd have said, no, the Iraq-Iran war, war is on right now. Your event might be misinterpreted in a particular way, so don't do it right now. And the 80s came and the 80s went. And then come the 90s, and if you wanted to do something of the kind, again it would be said that this would be seen geopolitically in a particular way, it would be interpreted differently, therefore it's not the time to do this right now. And every decade that comes, and every year that comes, somehow or the other there will be the complaint that an event of, of this nature is not opportune at this moment. Who is it that has to consider when the moment is opportune and when it is not opportune? Who has to consider geopolitical realities against the needs of a particular society right here? Not too long ago, when the Americans were marching on the gates of Baghdad, who was there to assist them? And who was there to take over leadership of the Iraqi population at that time? 
It was the Shia who very shortly before that had been sitting uh, under the protection of the Iranian state. They returned to Iraq and they became the, the rulers of the new government. And then geopolitics played no role. Open collaboration with the American invader. At that moment in time, no one raises uh, I, I, uh, any eyebrow to say that this is not geopolitically opportune for the Muslim world right now. But a small little group of people come together in a masjid to acquaint themselves better with a phenomenon that has been plaguing this community for a long time and this has to be seen as geopolitical a betrayal of the ummah. I think that we are applying double standards if we come to a conclusion such as that. The only reason why we have come together, the only reason why this platform was founded is to spread knowledge, to acquire to acquaint ourselves for no other reason no matter what the paper says out there you who have been here and who will still be here will notice that there is only one thing that's available here and that inshallah is knowledge and knowledge alone we do not go from here with any agenda but to use the knowledge which we have acquired in order to inoculate ourselves against any such things that will be detrimental to our particular part of the ummah here and to help others who find themselves in similar predicaments it is often said that out of everyone out there in the world is only the Shia who realized who is the great Satan, who is the great enemy. Everyone else, if you look at Sunni governments, well, they're not waking up to reality. They're in cahoots with this particular government. They're in cahoots with that particular government. Some of it is true, some of it might not be true. I just wish to relate to you something um, of my own personal experience. A few years ago, uh, a friend of mine from Johannesburg took me along to a cousin of his. This cousin, born a Sunni of course, had converted to Shiism. The one who converted him was the previous ambassador of Iran in this country, Ayatollah Muhammad Mahdawi. He was the one who converted him. So the friend of mine takes me along and says, please speak to my cousin. I went along, spoke to the cousin. He says, well, very well, we had a good discussion. Come back next week again, inshallah. Next week, he gives, he gives a phone call. He says, don't come back. I don't want you not to welcome in my house any longer. Fine, what's the problem? No, he'd been speaking to people. They told him, don't speak to those people. They're dangerous. Stay away from them. That's not the point, though. My friend, however, goes back to his cousin. The cousin says, that, you know, 10 years ago, I embraced Shiism. And at that time, like everyone else, I was believing also. That the greatest enemies of the Muslim Ummah today is America and is Britain and is Russia. Ten years within Shiism has led me to a new conclusion. The greatest enemies of the Ummah today is not America and Russia. It's not Britain and France. The greatest enemies of this Ummah is the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. I'm not going to generalize. I'm not going to say that every Shia believes like that. But what I can say is that in terms of what I have read of the Shia legacy, in terms of their particular vision of history that I have imbibed from their works, this fits perfectly and harmonizes perfectly with what is in there. So it's not very, very unlikely that a person would form an idea such as this. Because he has been fed a certain version of history. He has been fed a certain version of the interpretation of the Qur'an. He's been fed certain texts purporting to be from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is just natural that eventually he would come to a point where he says, the real enemy is not those on the outside, the real enemy are these who call themselves the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. We are here today in order to avert a situation where we start looking at one another in a similar way. Because when we start looking at one another in that way, then what will follow is the bloodshed that we spoke of in our first lecture. That's where we do not want to be. There's only one way to avoid that. And that is that for which we have come together here. Inoculate ourselves, equip ourselves with a sufficient store of knowledge that when that particular germs come knocking on your door, you do not succumb to it. We go on. The ayah which we wish to discuss tonight is called generally the ayatul wilaya. Now, wilaya, what does wilaya refer to? Wilaya refers to a relationship of mutual support, mutual assistance and friendship, solidarity. This kind of social solidarity 
should exist within this ummah has to exist between the members of this ummah Allah Ta'ala says wal mu'minuna wal mu'minatu ba'duhum awliya ba'd they are awliya mu'minun the, the believing men and the believing woman they are all the awliya of one another meaning that they are the friends and the supporters and they have solidarity among themselves this is one united ummah where we stand shoulder by shoulder against an enemy on the outside this is what we understand from the word wilaya as it is used in many different places in the Quran to the Shia however the word wilaya has a completely different meaning wilaya means your allegiance to the Ahlul Bayt wilaya means your allegiance to the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt therefore they read this ayah إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ your wali, in other words, that particular friend with whom you have solidarity, that particular friend who you regard as your master, that one whom you regard as your leader, it can only be Allah, it can be His Rasul, and it can be Walladina Amanu, the believers, Alladina Yukimuna Salata, who establish the Salah, Wa Yutuna Zakata, and they give Zakah, Wahum Rakiun, and they bow down. Now nothing in that ayah gives you any indication that there is a connection with the Ahlul Bayt thus far. But here we are going to look at two particular concepts. Two particular concepts which are going to be indispensable for understanding many similar ayat. Let us say from now already that we might not be able to cover each and every ayah which has been used by the Shia. But once we learn the principle behind it, then we will be able to apply those principles to any other ayah and come to a proper conclusion. Those two, those two principles, those two rules that we're going to learn here. Firstly, that of context. Once an ayah is seen within its proper context, its meaning emerges properly. Once an ayah is taken out of its context, then you can do with that whatever you want to. I want to give you an example thereof. How an ayah, once removed from its context, acquires a completely different meaning. The Shia have the aqidah that the Mahdi who is the 12th in their line of Imams he is still alive 1200 years ago he disappeared from the sight of men he is existing at some dimension somewhere he is there we do not see him he has been kept alive by Allah Ta'ala because heaven and earth depend upon his existence so he is there he is not leading he is not dispensing guidance he is not teaching anyone but he is there he is keeping everyone in existence Ask them now, where does the Quran speak about anything like this? We haven't come across anything they tell you. Baqiyatullahi khayrul lakum in kuntum mu'mineen. What's the baqiyatullah? That thing which Allah has kept extant for you. That thing which Allah has kept extant for you is better for you if you have iman. See, there it is, the ayah, baqiyatullah. Now the lesson of context. Take that ayah to its context and then see what does it mean. Where does the ayah come? Surah Hud, ayah number 86, 76, something of the kind. It is the story of Sayyidina Shu'ayb alayhi salam. Shu'ayb comes to his people, وَإِلَىٰ مَدْيَنَ أَخَاهُمْ شُعَيْبًا قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَٰهٍ غَيْرُ Shu'ayb is sent to his people of Madian. And the, he comes to them and tells them that you have no ilah but Allah Ta'ala. Inni akhafu alaykum adhaba yawmin muhir. I fear for you a day that will encompass you all, the adhab of such a day. Ya qawmi, awfu al-mikyala wal-nizana bil-qisti. And my people, he admonishes them. He tells them, give in full measure, the people of Madi and the people of Shu'ayb, they were traders. What they used to do, they used to cheat. In trade, they used to cheat. They used to cheat. So he tells them, give full measure. وَلَا تَبْخَسُ النَّاسَ أَشْيَاءَهُمْ Do not withhold people's things from them. وَلَا تَعْثَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُفْسِدِينَ Do not spread mischief in this earth. بَقِيَّةُ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Once you give people their haq, if you give them their haq, then something remains. Your risk remains. That risk which remains with you, that is better for you, if you indeed have iman. That is the meaning of baqiyatullahi khayrul lakum in kuntum mu'mineen. But you remove it from its context, then baqiyatullah, that person whom Allah Ta'ala kept for you one side, in some strange dimension, to keep the world alive. It's by removing ayat from its context, that much of the harm has been done. 
So this ayat is plucked from his context. It's given to a youngster. That youngster, as we said before, his last study of Islam was when he perhaps read the second Jews or the second part of Yassar al-Qur'an. Suddenly he is given this ayah from the Qur'an. He doesn't know left, he doesn't know right. He doesn't know which way to turn. All that he sees this ayah with a very, very clearly orchestrated meaning attached to it. There's the ayah you can see for yourself. He looks at it, he doesn't understand the ayah before it, he doesn't understand the ayah after it, he just sees this particular ayah. Much of what the spread of Shiism is all about in countries such as our, uh, our own is texts taken completely out of context. So that's the first lesson. Any ayah that's given has to fit into a context. Because why must it fit into a context? Because of coherence. What's, meaning, what's the meaning of coherence? Coherence is a bit of a big word for some people. Translated into Afrikaans makes it much easier to, under, uh, to understand. Sama hangant. Allah's hang sam. There is a connection. Allah Ta'ala speaks. You and I speak as well. In one sentence we don't, don't jump from one topic to the other. One sentence, in order to make sense, has to contain a subject and a predicate, and the subject must be related to the predicate in a reasonable and sensible way, then it makes sense, then it's a proper sentence. Otherwise it will just be prattle and babble. Allah Ta'ala does not prattle, Allah Ta'ala does not babble. Allah Ta'ala's words are full of hikmah, Allah Ta'ala's words is full of truth. Allah Ta'ala's words are coherent. So within the words of the Quran, there is this internal coherence that we must look for when we attach meaning to any particular ayah. That is why an ayah has to be contextualized in the text of the Quran where it stands. Now we come to our ayah. That was the first lesson that we had to learn. The second lesson will be the manner in which we use a hadith to elicit meaning out of the Quran. But let's go for the first one now. The first lesson is about contextualization. The second one is interaction between Quran and hadith. We go for the first one. The first one says, look at the context of this ayah. إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ Your wali is only Allah and His Rasul and those believers who make salah and give zakah and they go into ruku. If you want to understand the context of the Quran, let's move a few ayat back to where the passage starts from. Where does the passage start? Three, four ayat back we go. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu la tattakhidu al-yahuda wa nasara awliya ba'duhum awliya u ba'd. Oh you who believe, do not take the yahuda and the nasara as your awliya. This community must have internal solidarity amongst itself. This community must rely upon itself. Brother relies upon brother for this community to stand. Do not rely upon people from the outside. They are not your awliya. They are the awliya of one another. وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُمْ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ Anyone who has a wilaya relationship with a kafir instead of a mu'min, he would just as well as that is one of the kafirs. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ so what is Allah Ta'ala speaking of here? He's speaking of this community. Where must his wilaya be? Where must his solidarity be found? Where must that mutual relationship of wilaya be found? Between mu'min and mu'min. And what would happen? What would happen if there is no such wilaya then? If there are those who would turn away from this deen? Skip then one to ayat. Allah Ta'ala then says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. مَنْ يَرْتَدَّ مِنْكُمْ عَنْ دِينِهِ Anyone who turns his back on this deen becomes a murtad. فَسَوْفَ يَأْتِ اللَّهُ بِقَوْمِ يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَهُ Very very soon Allah is going to bring a group of people. Allah Ta'ala is going to bring a group of people if apostasy happens in this ummah and people find the wilaya outside. يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَهُ That people will be such. Allah loves them and they love him. Between the mu'mineen, they are meek and humble. But against the kafir, they are severe and staunch. They make jihad in the path of Allah Ta'ala. They fear not the reproach of anyone who would reproach them. ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ ذُو الْفَضْلِ الْعَظِيمِ That is Allah Ta'ala's grace which He gives to whoever He wants to. 
Allah Ta'ala's grace is most great. And then what's the next ayat after that? إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ Now Allah Ta'ala says, your wali, your true, the person with whom you should have wilaya, is not those kuffar out there. It is Allah and His Rasul and the Mu'minun tied into the first ayah. يَا أَيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَتَّخْذِ الْيَهُودَ وَالنَّصَارَ أَوْلِيَا Don't let the Yahud and Nasara be your awliya. Who must be awliya? إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ Your wilaya relationship is with Allah وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا And the entire community of Muslim believers. One, two ayat thereafter. Again Allah Ta'ala goes on. In other words, the line is drawn between who? Is a line drawn between Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ali and the Munafiqeen? No, the line is drawn between the Muslim community and the Kafir community. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la tattakhidu alladheena attakhadu deenakum huzuan wa la'iba. Don't take those as your awliya who makes who makes who take your deen as a matter of fun who make fun of your deen who are those min alladhina utul kitaba min qablikum wal kuffar the ahlul kitab and the kuffar now we know exactly who allah ta'ala means when he says your wali is only allah and his rasul i want to go back to the ayah in which allah ta'ala speaks about ridda and i want to show that by using this particular ayah of wilaya out of context the Shia have pulled wool over our eyes in a very, very big way. And they've made us overlook the purport and the meaning of this particular ayah. This ayah makes some very, very important statements. The ayah just before that. Allah Ta'ala makes a warning. Allah Ta'ala sounds a warning. If anyone becomes murtad in this ummah, he says, يَا أَيُّوَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَنْ يَرْتَدَّ مِنْكُمْ عَنْ دِينِ فَسَوْفَ يَأْتِ اللَّهُ بِقَوْمٍ يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَ Allah will bring such a people. Now listen how Allah Ta'ala describes these people. What are they like? Allah loves them. They love Allah. يُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَذِلَّةٍ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَعِزَّةٍ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ They are meek to the believer. They are harsh against the unbeliever. These people's iman is in very high standing by Allah Ta'ala. يُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ They make jihad and they don't care what anyone says about them. وَلَا يَخَافُونَ لَوْمَ تَلَائِمْ Who are these people? That's a big question. Did ridda occur in this ummah? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam closes his eyes. Leaves this world. Departs. 23 years of struggle is over. And immediately around the Arabian Peninsula there are tribes who start saying well while Muhammad was alive, we would have followed. Right now, Tini Kansni. There are those who would say, yes, Salah we will make, but Zakah we won't. Whole scale, daylight, apostasy is taking place. Only Medina, only Medina stands firm against this entire tidal wave of apostasy. Who stands up? Who is that person who Allah Ta'ala will bring? Who is what? يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَ That Allah loves them and they love Him. That they are meek to believers and harsh against unbelievers. That in their making of jihad, they care not for the reproach of any reproacher. If that, is that anyone but who? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq رضي الله عنه الصحابة These are the people who Allah Ta'ala speaks about. Allah Ta'ala said what? فَسَوْفَ يَأْتِ اللَّهِ Now whether you speak Shia Arabic or you speak Sunni Arabic, the word sofa means one thing only. The word sofa means very, very, very soon this will happen. It won't be a matter of delay. It won't be a matter of delay. The moment that Ridda happens, Allah is going to send this people. That Ridda happened. History is witness to the fact that this history happened. And it is shown that who was the man who saved the day for Islam there? It was Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. The ayah that in which Allah Ta'ala indicates the fada'il of Abu Bakr, indicates the high status of Abu Bakr, practice, everything short but naming his name. This is a person, says Allah Ta'ala, and the Sahaba with him, that Allah loves them, and they love him. This is a group of people, أَذِلَّةٍ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَعِزَّةٍ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ They are meek to believers. What about this entire story of attacking the house of Fatima and hurting the Ahlul Bayt? It doesn't fit in with this ayah. This ayah says this group of Sahaba is what? أَذِلَّةٍ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And as for the kuffar out there, no relenting. No acceptance whatsoever. Not, they do not give quarter against any of these kuffar. They make jihad. And in their making of jihad, they care not for what anyone would say. This ayah, this entire passage here, instead of being 
an ayah that the Shia could use for their particular purposes, it's something which indicates to us the Ahlul Sunnah, the high status of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, the Muhajirin and the Ansar and the rest of the Sahaba. So how did this ayah come to be a proof for the Shia? This is the second part of the lesson. The first part of the lesson, contextualize the ayah, you will realize where the ayah is going to. How did it happen that this ayah came to be read as Ali ibn Abi Talib? That your wali is only Allah and his Rasul and the authority of Allah comes to the Rasul, the authority of the Rasul goes to Ali. And Allah Ta'ala calls Ali what? Alladheena yuqeemoona salata wa yu'tuna zakata wa umraki'oon. He calls him those people who make salah and those people who give zakah and they go into ruku'ah. The reason for such an interpretation, first of all, is rooted in what we saw last week. What did we see last week? The entire Quran gives no credibility, no foundation whatsoever for the concept of imama. It has to be scratched out of some ayah, some or the other. You have to go and scrape the barrel to find something that some or the other would pr- produce a foundation for imama. So they found this ayah. So around this ayah then started what? Forgery of a hadith. Now, what is hadith? Hadith are the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But, not everything ascribed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is necessarily an authentic hadith. That's what we have to learn now. Not everything that it is said, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is necessarily a hadith. Not everything written into a hadith book is necessarily a hadith either for that reason. We, hadith has to be subjected to a scrutiny, to a very critical methodology in order to ascertain whether this is in fact authentic or whether it is not authentic. Many are those who would have had exposure to books of the Shia in which they tell them if you go to this page of that particular book then you will see this ayah there or this hadith there. Last week, after our lesson of last week, a brother came up to me. He says, but the names of the books were written there and these are all Sunni books. I've got several questions on that. Brother, how would you know a Sunni book from a Shia book? How would you know when the book is written by a Sunni, when the book is written by a Shi'i? This is something which scholars that study for many, many years can still make mistakes on. Not everyone has seen every book. That is a very highly specialized field. So when you find these books giving references to the, the books of the Ahlul Sunnah, every name doesn't necessarily mean it has to be checked up. But you know the writer is banking on something. The author of the book is banking on the fact that you're not going to look. Why? Because you generally don't have the access to go and look. Either you lack the language, or if you know the language, you don't know the book. If you know the book, then you don't have access to it. If you have access to it, you might not be able to critically assess it. Therefore, these are the various angles from which they take advantage, put something in front of you, and the youngster reads the book and he says, I saw this from authentic Sunni literature. No. In Islam, we take cognizance first and foremost of the fact that the history of the transmission of hadith was not divorced from problems. There were problems from day one already. There were people spreading a hadith in the name of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa from the earliest days already. And Ibn Abi al-Hadid, Ibn Abi al-Hadid is a Shia scholar, and he wrote a commentary on the Nahjul Balagha of Sayyid Radi, which is supposed to be a collection of the statements of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ibn Abi al-Hadid writes in this book, Sharh Nahjil Balagha of his that he says the first people to start the forgery of hadith in the history of Islam were the Shia. Why did they have to start the forgery of hadith? Because they needed, they needed proof for their statements. They needed proof. What better way to find the proof but project statements right back into the mouth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Therefore, the ulama developed a critical methodology. They kept lists of names of all those narrators. They would say, this narrator is a reliable narrator. As for that one, he is not reliable. Any narrator of hadith has to satisfy a number of criteria. He has to be endowed with a certain amount of integrity. He has to thereafter have a certain amount of ability to preserve a hadith until the time of transmission. Each link in the transmission, in the chain of transmission of a hadith has to have similar abilities. He has to have this combination of integrity plus ability. And then thereupon that hadith has to, that chain of uh, transmission has to be uninterrupted from beginning up to end. Uninterrupted, it has to be 
a complete chain where each link in the chain heard the hadith from the one above him he also being a reliable person the one above him also being a reliable person with that kind of background we now come, we now come to this hadith here in order to illustrate it somewhat more clearly I will tell you a few years ago 10, 15 if not more 20 years ago the satanic verses came out and we all marched against it and we all had the biggest of problems with it because Salman Rushdie was ascribing certain things to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam about satanic verses now he did not suck this out of his thumb where did he get it? from some books from some history books you can look in those history books up to today those transmissions those uh, narrations are there the reason why we take exception to them is because they might be there but they are not authentic. There are a lot of ahadi that are forgeries. The ulama know them. They know how to differentiate between the weak ones and the strong ones. Between the forged ones and the authentic ones. So it's an entire very specialized field where many many feet unfortunately have slipped already. With that as background now we come to this particular hadith in front of this ayah. Now this ayah as we have seen now, in terms of its very wording, there is no mention of Ali ibn Abi Talib or any of the Imams. In terms of, it con of its context, it indicates rather the validity, authenticity of the Khilaf of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. So how can we take it now out of its context like this and make it refer to something like the Imam of the Ahlul Bayt that we have seen of the 12 Imams? It is by creating a new context. Taking it out of his old context and creating a new context. And the new context is created as follows. Once upon a time in the masjid a beggar came in. The beggar asked around, no one was giving anything. Ali ibn Abi Talib was standing in salah. He was in ruku, no one was giving anything. So in ruku he took off his ring and he gave it to this person. Remember, in salah, alladhina yuqimuna salah. Wa yutuna zakah and he's giving the ring. Wa hum raki'oon and he's making ruku. So that's how this ayah came to be connected to Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Now we come to those narrations. Those narrations exist. And they exist in books which by and large belong to the Ahl Sunnah, yes. But not everything in there is authentic. Before we come to the detailed scrutiny of those particular ahadith, we wish to say one thing first. Allah Ta'ala fears no one. Allah Ta'ala doesn't need to speak tongue in cheek. Allah Ta'ala doesn't need to speak in riddles. If Allah Ta'ala wishes to say that Muhammad is my Rasul, then he says Muhammadur Rasulullah. If Allah Ta'ala wishes to say that Ali is the Imam, he said Ali is the Imam after Muhammad. He didn't say so. It's only by creating new contexts and by using the bit of leeway that exists in the field of hadith that people could create something like this. This particular narration of Ali ibn Abi Talib being in salah and giving the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the ring in, 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 to the beggar in that particular way, there are several narrations throughout the books of the Ahlu Sunnah. It's there, but just being there doesn't necessarily mean that it is correct. The most famous version of that hadith, it comes in the book Asbab al-Nuzul of Al-Wahidi. Now Asbab al-Nuzul, a book that speaks about circumstances of the revelation of the Quran. How did the ayah come down? This book, Asbab al-Nuzul, of, of, of course is in Arabic, it has been translated into English as well. It contains the hadith, it contains the sanad of the hadith, which is a chain of transmission as well. The chain of transmission in this case is extremely revealing. Who is the chain of transmission? Hadith experts would know. I know the Sheikh Shaheen just came in there. He is a hadith expert. You would know. The chain of transmission goes as follows. Muhammad ibn Marwan An Muhammad ibn Sa'ib al-Kalbi An Abi Salih An Abi Hurairah What is this Isnad like? These are just names. To the common person, this is just names. To the hadith expert, he immediately recognizes the sanad to be the most notorious sanad under the face of the earth, under of the sun, on the face of the earth, under the sun. So notorious that I'm even getting mixed up in my words. <laughs> Muhammad ibn Marwan al Suddi Sagheer, an open and self confessed liar, narrating from an even bigger liar, Muhammad ibn Sa'ib al Kalbi. Narrating from someone who's either a liar of similar stature or bigger than him, even Abu Salih, Abu Salih the Quran. These three persons, Muhammad ibn Marwan, Muhammad ibn Sa'ib, and Abi Salih and Ibn Abbas, and Abi Salih and Ibn Abbas. This sanad, this chain of transmission, has a very, very special name to the hadith experts. They speak about two kinds of, uh, of, of uh, chain of transmission. The one is the highest level. 
the best that you can get. Malik and Nafi and Ibn Umar. Imam Malik narrating from his teacher Nafi, he narrates from Ibn Umar. Or Muhammad ibn Jafar and Abihi and Jaddihi and Ali. The Isnad of the Ahlul Bayt. These are of the best Isnads that you can get. We call that Silsilatul Dhahab, the chain of gold. This one in front of us is no Silsilatul Dhahab. This one is Silsilatul Kadib. The chain of lies. That's what Muhaddithin call it. This is the chain of lies. A chain of self-confessed liars create a story which does not conform with the context of the ayah, which does not conform to what we know about the grandeur majesty of Allah Ta'ala who does not speak in riddles. It, it seeks to create something out of the ayah by bringing a hadith of this nature into existence. That is the origin of this particular story here. And from there the story has spread to a number of other sources as well. In the Mu'ajam Awsat of Imam Tabarani, as well as the Azbab Nuzul of Wahidi, once again, the same story is transmitted, this time on the authority of Sayyidina Ammar ibn Yasir. But when you look at the chain of transmitters now, completely unknown entities. Silsilatum min al-majahil. People completely majhul, you don't know, can we base our deen on people who don't, we don't even know who they are? This is the kind of chains of transmission upon which a story such as this has been uh, based. Then we go elsewhere. A similar story is transmitted in the tafsir of Ibn Mardawai. A book that's not even existing any longer. In the tafsir of Ibn Mardawai, a hadith like this is transmitted from Ali ibn Abi Talib. That is not. That chain of transmission, Hafiz ibn Kathir tells us in his tafsir, is once again, is weak and suffers from an entire chain of unknown persons. Again unknown persons. Our deen is not based upon the words of unknown persons. Bottom line being, look at any of those asani, you will find not a single one of them is free of defect. Not a single one is free of defect. So it clashes with the context. It clashes with the majesty and the power and the fearlessness of our Rabb Jalla Jalalu. And it does not even satisfy the criteria of authenticity. A similar kind of scenario will play itself off in many other similar ayat. Where they use a had an ayah connected to a hadith, you as the person in the street might not know what is authentic and what is not. In cases such as that, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ If you don't know, if a person comes to you in the street, he tells you, take this pill. This is very good for whatever sickness you are suffering from. You don't just take it. You go to a doctor and ask him, look, here's something. It's got something written on it. I don't understand what is it. Tell me, can I take this or can I not? Similarly, someone comes to you, gives the, an interpretation of the ayah of the Quran, gives you a hadith or you read it in a book somewhere, don't rush into making judgment on that basis as has happened up to now. I just want to quickly, something comes to mind again. I saw the article in the paper today. And mashallah, Sheikh Al-Fan was smiling very nicely on the photo as well. But that was not the point. The point was, it was very, very clearly stated in that, in that uh, article there, that the Shia are not here to, to propagate. They are not here to propagate. They are simply here to be Shia, not to propagate. If they are not here to propagate, will anyone please explain to me how come 95, if not 99% of the members of the Ahlul Bayt right out there are people who not very long ago belonged to our side of the divide. How did they go over? Did they suddenly wake up one day with a dream that I have to go across to the other side? There was some kind of propagation going on. There are those sitting here who will be able to know from their own experiences, having gone there and said, look, I want literature. And they were given literature. So most certainly, no, propagation is going on unabated. And it's for that reason that we come together to educate ourselves about things of this nature here. Now, it can become quite boring if you can have to take every ayah and uh, do a similar kind of uh, analysis here. The person in the street simply wants to know is that hadith authentic or is not authentic? It's unauthentic if you want to know the reasons why it is there. We can go into the details. As we have gone here, there's even further details in this. However, this is the situation of these ayah, these are hadith that we face. Second ayah. Let's go on to a second ayah. A second ayah in this regard here, very common ayah, very well known to the Shia. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجِسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا O oh, Ahlul Bayt, O oh, people of the house, all that Allah Ta'ala wishes to do is to take away, لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسِ Take all impurity away from you, O oh, household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَيُطَهِّرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا To purify you thoroughly. So in this ayah, the Shia will produce several ahadith. In this case, many of those ahadith are authentic. The fact that we said these ones of the ayah of wilaya not being authentic, 
in the case of the ayatul tathir where we are now in ma yurid Allah liyudhib ankum ar-rizq now many of those hadith are authentic and some of them are not authentic as well the ayah says what in ma yurid Allah Allah wishes to liyudhib ankum ar-rizq to take impurity away from you ahl al-bayt or people of the house wa yutahhirukum tathira to purify you thoroughly again let's apply what we've learned in the previous ayah First of all, contextualize. Once we contextualize the ayah, let's go a little bit back. Ya ayyuha nabi qul li azwajik O nabi, O prophet, tell your wives In kuntunna turidana al-hayata al-dunya wa zinataha fata'alayna umatti'kunna wa usarrihkunna sarahan jameela وَإِن كُنْتُنَّ تُرِدَنَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَالدَّارَ الْآخِرَةِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ أَعَدَّ لِلْمُحْسِنَاتِ مِنْكُنَّ أَجْرًا عَظِيمًا Allah speaking to the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in very previous telling him What do you want? Do you want this dunya or want the akhirah? If you want the dunya, take the dunya and go off. If you want the akhirah, Allah is prepared to give you that. And then the ayah goes on. Those are the last few ayat of the 21st Jews. Now we go to the 22nd Jews. وَمَن يَقْنُطْ مِنْكُمْ نَلِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَتَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا نُؤْتِهَا أَجْرَهَا مَرَّتَيْنِ وَأَعْتَدَنَا لَهَا رِزْقًا كَرِيمًا Allah Ta'ala speaks once again to the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and tells those of them that are obedient, Allah Ta'ala will give them their reward. يَا نِسَاءَ النَّبِي O wives of the Prophet. لَسْتُنَّكَ أَحَدٍ مِّنَ النِّسَاءِ إِنِ اتَّقَيْتُنْ You are unlike any other women. If you have taqwa, your state is unlike any other one. فَلَا تَخْضَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ فَيَطْمَعَ الَّذِي فِي قَلْبِهِ مَرَضٍ Do not speak in soft or hearing tones that that person in whose heart there is an illness, he will start having desire. وَقُلْنَ قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنْ Allah speaks to only one, not to the entire Ummah yet. He only speaks to those group that are honored enough to be Ummahatul Mu'mineen. The mothers of the believers. And he goes on, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنْ Remain within your houses. وَلَا تَبَرَّجَنَ تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ الْأُولَى Do not go out of your houses. Do not sally forth from your houses like used to happen in the Jahiliyyah before. وَأَقِمْنَ الصَّلَاةِ سَمِّ الصَّلَاةِ وَآتِينَ الزَّكَاةِ Give zakah وَأَطِعْنَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهِ And then إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ Now Allah says Who is Allah Ta'ala been speaking to all along? The wives of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُنْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِّرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا Why does Allah want you to do all of this? Turn away from the dunya, take the akhirah. Stay within your houses, don't be touched by any impurity. Stay within your houses, make salah, give your zakah, and be obedient to Allah and His Rasul, because Allah wants to take impurity away from you. Allah doesn't want any impurity to attach itself to the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We not finish. وَذْكُرْنَ مَا يُتْلَى فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ And O wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you are living with him in the house, you are there when the ayat are revealed, you hear his words when he speak, remember those ayat that were revealed, remember those words that he spoke in order that you will one day be able to carry it and transmit it on to others after you. Now you've seen the entire context of the ayah. You've seen the context of the ayin, who was being spoken to. Now comes the problem. The problem says, and those that know Arabic would know, when you speak to a group of females, you speak in a particular way. You use a particular kind of verb and you use a particular kind of pronoun. So it is said, qarna, wadhkurna. That is for specifically a group of females. But when it comes to this particular portion in the middle, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُهِبَ عَنْكُمْ That becomes male. Why? The Shia tells us because now Allah is not speaking to the wives any longer. Allah is not speaking to the wives any longer. He's speaking to who? To only a specific group of people. Who, who is that particular group of people? 
and how they mention the ayat or rather the ahadith they say when that ayah came Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called Ali, Hassan, Hussein and Fatima and he enveloped them in a cloak in his house and he told Allah Allahumma haulai ahli bayti fa'adhib anhumur rijsa wa tahirum tathira oh Allah this is my ahlul bayt so take impurity away from them and purify them as well there is a difference in the way that we understand it, the Shia understand it. The Shia understanding is one of incoherence. Allah has jumped from one topic to another topic and he goes back to the first topic again. That's incoherent. That is irreconcilable with the status of Allah Ta'ala. We the Ahlul Sunnah say, look very clearly at what Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying there. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam noticed that Allah Ta'ala has changed the pronoun. When he changes the pronoun, that means there are more people included in the ayah now than just the wives alone. There are more people included now. Who could that be? He did not know. So he made a dua. He brought these people together. Therefore he asks Allah Ta'ala. Allah, this is my Ahlul Bayt. So include them as well by Adhib anhum rizza wa tahirum tatira. So the ayah did not jump from one topic to the other. It was speaking to the wives. And then he spoke to the wives and others as well. And then he comes back to the wives alone again. That is coherent. That is in keeping with the majesty and the grandeur of the language of the Quran. There are some versions of the hadith that would say that Umm Salama radiallahu anha was present. And she told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I as well. And he told her, no, not you. That's not a correct version of the hadith. That version suffers from a, a problem in his isnad. Because that very same hadith has been transferred differently. He tells her... Anti ala khair. You are already upon good. In other words, the ayah is already speaking to you. You don't have to stand under the slope. You are already included. This is special just to include these few people here. I want these people to be the extra ones that are included in this ayah. We go on from there to something else. Now this ayah, say the Shia. The Shia say it only applies to these, this particular group of people here. And on this basis they claim that the imams are completely faultless. Completely Free from any mistake. As masoom, as faultless, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa himself was, he cannot make a mistake. Impossible. He is more faultless, flawless than even the Pope. He doesn't make a mistake at all. Why they say, can't you see that the ayah says, Allah has taken all impurity away from them, and Allah has purified them. Our first answer will be, so what does the ayah say? It speaks to the wives as well. If you're going to say these five people are masoom, that they are infallible, then you're going to have to say the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa are infallible as well. And, mind you, these are not the only people about whom Allah Ta'ala has said such things. Allah Ta'ala said similar things about another very special group of people. Which special group of people are, is that? If you have a question, you can ask me to ask you 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 to وَيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ رِجَزَ الشَّيْطَانِ To purify you and take the impurity of shaitan away from you. So a Shia I spoke to once, he says, well that's only water. That's only water to wash it away. My question would be, look at the rest of the ayah. وَيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ رِجَزَ الشَّيْطَانِ وَلِيَرْبِطَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَيُثَبِّتَ بِهِ الْأَقْدَامِ Which water can do that? Strengthen your heart and make your feet firm on the battlefield. That's just not just water that washes a few blood stains and a few clots here and there away. That's a very special water. That water Allah Ta'ala put onto, brought down to the, the people of Badr. For which reason? To strengthen their hearts upon Iman. To strengthen their feet to stand at the battle of Badr against those Kuffar, who was that? That was Abu Bakr, that was Umar, that was all those other Sahaba radiallahu anhu who were present there on that day. And look specifically at what the very same things which Allah Ta'ala said, Ya about the Ahlul Bayt, Allah says, Ya about the Sahaba, Yudhib ankum rizza shaitan, inna ma yuridu Allah li yudhib ankum rizz. Yutahirakum tathira, yudhib ankum, and Ya Allah Ta'ala says, uh, as well. There's tathir here, there's idhab or here, there's removal of impurity and there's purification on both sides. So if this ayah in Surah Al-Ahzab, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ has to mean that the Ahlul Bayt are infallible and therefore they only can be the Imams. 
Well, that creates a question. What about the Sahaba? Why look at one ayah and not look at the other one? The Quran is one coherent book. The Quran is its own best tafsir. You want to understand what the Quran says? Don't take things out of context. Once again you can see how something when taken out of context can be given a meaning of its own. Then we don't stop there. We say that fine, if it is as you say, that this ayah proves that the, those particular people under the cloak, which is who? Ali, Hassan, Hussein, and Fatima radiallahu anha, that these four people became infallible on account of being present there. How did the rest of the twelve imams become infallible? They were not under the cloak. They might say, well, but well, they descendants of the people under the cloak. There were many other descendants of the people under the cloak as well. They did not only have uh, uh, eight, nine descendants. They had many other descendants. Their descendants spread all over the world. The children of Hassan, the children of Hussein, how many are they? How come this infallibility only devolves after Hussein upon his son? And only upon his son and only upon... What about all the other children of the very same Imams as well? So some, the ayah, taking the ayah to make it say what the Shia wish to make it say here, it simply doesn't. If you use nothing more than reason, you will notice that it simply cannot fit. It simply cannot fit into the context. It is a meaning superimposed over the ayah to give it a meaning. It is foreign to the Quran. Why is it foreign to the Quran? Because the entire concept of the Shayyu is foreign to the Quran. The Quran doesn't espouse the concept of the Shayyu. The Quran said, "Inna ladina farraqu dinahum wa kanu shi'an lasta minhum fi shay." Those who split the din up into little parties and groupings, you, O Muhammad, you have nothing to do with them. This Qur'an never espoused the idea of small little partisan groupings, this one supporting this one, that one supporting that one. This is absolutely unfounded in the Qur'an. So if someone wants to come from the outside and apply meanings to the Qur'an, you will find that he's always busy fitting a square into the circle. He's superimposing something into a space that doesn't fit it. Therefore, you will have to make use of various different mechanisms, forging of a hadith sometimes, and decontextualization, taking the eye out of context. And when our people get exposed to it, they don't know the context, they don't know the proper tafsir, they are told, Baqiyatullahi khayrul lakum in kuntum mu'mineen refers to the Eid mahdi not very long they will be told Maraj al-Bahrain also refers to the Ahlul Bayt, as we have seen last week. So these two ayat we've taken by way of example, like this, there are many other similar ayat which do not fit into that particular context. We have a long way to go still. After these ayat, we have to look at many, many other ahadith. And the reason why you have to look at them is so that the first time you get to hear of it has to be here, not out there when you come across it in the book or when the Shia diet tells you about it. You come here to be inoculated and there, then you go out and you can face all of those germs, whatever types of germs they might happen to be. So therefore, we use these particular sessions to acquaint ourselves. We looked at these two ayat, like that there are many others, apply the same two rules that you have seen here today. First, insist upon contextualization. Don't just throw ayat uh, while they are on, contextualize the ayah, and if you're going to use any hadith, bring the authenticity of it. And who will prove authenticity? The experts who, are, who have studied, who have acquired the science and the details of this particular science of when a thing is sahih, authentic, and when it is not sahih. How we have set up to now is designed as a slur against any particular person against any particular group. This deen is Allah Ta'ala's deen that he has sent to us. And this deen has suffered a lot of distortion along the course of history. This deen, our forefathers have managed somehow or the other to safeguard, to preserve for themselves over the many years. Everything that came up in the past, every fitna that came up, there had to be a response. The older people amongst us might still remember back in the days of the late Sheikh Ahmad Bahauddin Rahmatullahi Ali. There was a little book called the Khaskidanus on Haji Abdullah. Those who know it know it. And those who don't know it, what is this book all about? The Enchi Kerr, the Dutch Reformed Church at that time found, and this would have been when? In the 50s, 40s, 60s? I don't quite know. But the Dutch Reformed Church at the time found that these Muslims were an obstacle to us. We want to convert them, we cannot make headway. So what did they do? They wrote a little booklet, supposedly by a person called Haji Abdullah, in which he says, you know, I was born a Muslim, 
but for this and that and that and a long story it goes I'm no longer a Muslim because Bakir and Yira Hallelujah at that time our ulama under the leadership of Shaykh Ahmad Bihadin uh, Rahmatullahi Ali and the other ulama at the time they took up the fight they took up the casuals against it today we barely even know that the khaskinness of Aziz Abdullah was ever written because our ulama stood up to it once upon a time Thereafter came a new fitna. The Baha'is came, the Qadianis came. This we will know about. We were, most of us were born, most of us had seen what had happened. Fitna comes, the ulama stand up, they take up kajils on behalf of Islam, they defend our aqidah, and the fitna goes. فَأَمَّا الزَّبَدُ فَيَذْهَبُ جُفَاءَ وَأَمَّا مَا يَنْفَعُ النَّاسَ فَيَمْكُثُ فِي الْأَرْضِ All the zabad, all the scum, now the scum is being used in the, in the sense of what you find on top of the the, 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 what's this? In, in the sea, all that foam. I mean, I'm saying that because people might misunderstand. The t- direct translation of that is zabad, or is that scum. But the scum, what happens to the scum? It goes. It doesn't remain. What is scum after all? It's a whole lot of small little bubbles that the moment you're exposed to air, it just bursts open and is gone. As for that, which is of benefit to mankind, that remains. This aqidah has remained. It's remained for one, two, three centuries. It will remain from here onwards, inshallah. It depends upon what you and I are going to do about it. What you and I are going to do about it, are we going to let each fitna just come and uh, be, let, let our town, our country, our part of the ummah be a walk over to them? I don't think so. I don't think so. Let those who are taking offense, let those who are taking exception and umbrage to the fact that the Ahlul Sunnah have come together in Darul Islam's masjid in order to discuss, discuss Shiism, let them take offense. It is not of major concern to us what the Cape Times and the Argus will write about us. It's what we're going to do when we stand in front of Allah Rabbul Aizza one day. That is our responsibility. Let us be conscious thereof. At the same time, let us maintain balance in the way that we go about doing it. We will not go about defaming. We will not go about doing the kind of things that people will very much want to see out there in order so they can say that we are hooligans. We are not hooligans. We are custodians of the deen of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Well, I was still to be in Now, it's question time, we only have about uh, 20 minutes, 27 minutes, okay? The young man is sad, but he would like to be more out of the question. What's the agreement? May I accept two questions? Maximum two questions. So, maximum two questions. Number two. Number two. If the speaker is irrelevant, that people can sit and respectfully listen. So we have to ask the Jamaa, listen, please go out me. No, no, you must not be out of talk. The speaker says irrelevant and you accept it to be irrelevant. Question number one. You can ask one now, one for later, you can ask both questions at the same time. Alright, question number one. No question, 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 like they were quoting in the Imam, of Imam, Mr. Rasulullah had only one daughter. Hada Jibreel Uja, you are Limkum Dinakum, but Asamon knows the answer. He knows the answer, but he wants to teach a lesson. He's like the hadith of Jibreel. When he comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he asks the question, he actually wants you to learn something. So with the Samon, yes, you are correct. Uh, there is some discrepancy over there. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had how many daughters? There was Ruqayya, there was Ummu Kulthum, there was Zainab, and there was Fatima. Radiyallahu anhunna ajma'een. But however, we notice something, that out of those three daughters, uh, four daughters, only one was given in marriage to someone from Banu Hashim. The other three were given in marriage to people from Banu Umayyah. Zainab was given in marriage to Abu Asib and Rabi'ah. Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum 
after their first marriage which was not consummated, the sons of Abu Lahab, they were both given in marriage to Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, one after the other. Now to us as the Ahlul Sunnah, we find fine, that's no problem because it's the great Sahabi. The Shia have a major problem because this Uthman is a very very bad person. I don't want to say how bad. There are some times when I feel that these are things which we cannot even speak in a masjid, so bad it becomes. But anyway, this is a person of the worst possible character. How can Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam give his daughters to him one after the other? Ruqayya and Umukulthum. Therefore, faced with this problem, there were those of them, and again I would not generalize and say all of them, because all of them don't even know that this is there in their books. They say that these three weren't the daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Only Fatima was his daughter, Ruqayya was not his daughter, Umm Kulthum was not his daughter, and Zainab was not his daughter. Now if you say that to a common person in the street, he will take offense. This is not any common person. This is our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Good, good. Is there a question to the ladies? Uh, I just want to ask one question. You mentioned something about the Shias actually having a big happy thing. My question is actually. When you take a learning of Kafi, how capable are those groups of Kafi that they actually are using? I wish I can answer that question in five minutes. But something like three, four hours would be more suited to it. Inshallah, I hope to have a complete session about the hadith of the Shia alone. In one line, not very credible. Not very credible. Um, originally when Kulaini wrote his book, he claimed that everything in it was above board. He claimed. And he died in the year 327, 328 after the Hijrah. Many, many years later, in the Safavid era, something like eight centuries after him, the Shia submitted it to scrutiny with their new principles. They found that some 60 to 70 percent of what's in there is not authentic. And uh, these days, some more studies are going on. And whenever they get nailed down to, we tell them, well, this is in Al Kafi of Kulaini, they say, well, but that's not authentic. So uh, there's a huge problem of authenticity. The reasons behind it, inshallah, I hope to sketch out to you very, very clearly in a future lesson, inshallah. Any question on the ladies' side? Are you going to write it down, man? Are you going to write it down? Okay, then read it. Any other gentlemen? Any questions? Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Anu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. With Maulana's experience dealing with different issues in the community, we're facing the Shias who are converting the Sunnis. Could we as Sunnis also have a how can I put it, the duty of sometimes also we will take hadith and Quran out of context and becoming a more traditional Sunni and therefore making it easier for the Shias or any other group converting them to, to what point. And in conclusion, the other question is if someone had to openly say that three imams are illegitimate and is striving to Muta, would that person be to be a Muslim? Any compromise on standards of authenticity, any compromise on standards of authenticity of hadith and bringing into circulation unauthentic hadith and forgery is bound to bring about a certain upsetting of the apple cart. It's going to have a, a domino effect to lead to certain other things. So the point being that as far as possible try to stick to what is authentic. Try not to go to anything unauthentic. Various different groups across the board will use or will compromise authenticity. Uh, it should not be done. It's going to have, uh, it's not a phenomenon restricted to the Shia alone. However, the Shia use in a very particular way. They do it in a very uh, specific manner. So in their case, I think we are, uh, we have to be more on our guard than anyone else. The others do it as well, uh, not to the same level. The second part, that is a very, very controversial question, which I have made it a principle here that we will not go to the issue whether the Shia are Muslim or not Muslim. All that I will say here is this, that what takes a person out of the fold of Islam? What takes a person out of the fold of Islam is inkar ma huwa ma'loom min ad-deen bid-darura. When a person rejects 
denies anything which is categorically and undeniably part of deen. Now, what exactly is that? That's probably a complete other lesson to identify exactly what are the categorical aspects of deen which are not the categorical aspects. But that's more or less what it comes down to. Some of the things that the Shia do cross that limit. Some of the things which they do do not cross the limit. Not every Shia crosses the limit. Not everyone uh, never crosses the limit either. So the answer is very, very... Uh, complicated, sophisticated, we're not going to go there. Not now. Um, at some point or the other, I think people will start getting an idea of exactly where the discrepancies lie with Shiism, but we're not going to go to that question, perhaps at a later date. <laughs> Tabrani? Yeah. Is the hadith of Ammar ibn Yasir that is contained in Mu'ajim Awsat of Tabrani from Ammar ibn Yasir and the hadith, the isnad of the hadith contains an entire series of unknown persons. Does that answer the question? Okay. Unreliable. Unreliable. That's by Tabrani, yes. One of the I didn't quite get the uh, two comments and one question. Is that from the constitution question? Two questions. One comment. I didn't quite get the reference in terms of the iron relating to the Walia and the our relations we should be against the Kafi and the Jahud and we can be subdued and humble towards the Muslim. The reference, you only mean the number of the ayah and so on? Yeah, but in your response, you can And then the second issue is that we cannot be naive to think that the media in South Africa, I mean, the rich history that they do have, sometimes controversial and other times not, is going to blow up the particular matter of the complete proportion. If one considers that, in fact, it was yourself, Chef, your um, was quoted in the artist tonight that um, it's, a, it's a way to fall. Now, we can almost predict, given the history of the media in South Africa, that that is the one line that will probably be uh, blown out of proportion amongst any other thing. So I think we should just be cautious about that and not be naive to think that they're not going to use that particular line amongst all the other good things that may have been said in the article. The third comment I'd like to make if I put your indulgence, is the, the issue around throughout your team, Molina, and what you said. You, you keep on making reference to this being the expert. This being the expert. If it's a medical issue, it's been adopted. And again, I'm going to repeat my question of last week. Is it not prudent, therefore, to bring somebody from the shade store, bring them in, right, and that person will then have to be in a position and we can then question the veracity of whatever you say that you are out the thing by the expert himself. He then is the doctor. He can either refuse or he or she can then confirm all the other things that are being said. The first thing, the ayah is Surah Al Ma'idah, ayah number 54, I think. Adilatin al Mu'min, Adilatin al Kafirin. The comment about uh, the newspaper, yes. Comments like this had been made not just now, it has been made for many years. But has anyone noticed how often the MGC has been in the papers of recent? There's someone going out there and telling the papers this. Years ago these comments were made, no one was running to the papers. But for some reason or the other, the MGC is making an appearance in the paper every second day. If it's not a fatwa, then it's Sheikh Irfan. If it's not Sheikh Irfan next, I think next will perhaps be the chickens again. <laughs> so I think it, it, there's a, a need for responsibility on the side of those present here. Look, our fights are our fights. Our issues are our issues. Does every Tom, Dick and Harry on the street out there need to know that what Sheikh Irfan said about the Shia? I mean, there are Catholics out there, there are Protestants out there, there are Jews and Hindus and atheists. Do they really need to see all our dirty washing? I think the problem lies not in the statement that Sheikh Irfan made. There have been much more inflammatory statements made, not just here, but individually as well. 
those were never taken to the to the papers but there are people with an agenda now those people with an agenda have to take note of the brother's comment very good comment but it needs to go around a bit more then the other side same question same response this is not a debate debates for a thousand years have not solved this problem because in debate you find what they call circumlocution big word means beat around the bush you say I say you say I say it doesn't I've been in debate situations before I've read debate literatures before it doesn't really solve any kind of problem and I'll tell you another thing brother with all due respect to um, recently there was a spate an issue at UCT the Ahlul Bayt Foundation gave out a pamphlet a pamphlet which was absolutely misrepresenting what's in the books of the Shia absolutely misrepresenting making a statement that none of the ulama of the Shia had ever questioned the authenticity of the Quran one of the four sources which he quotes I opened the book in front of me I said but here the very book is saying it the very thing which you are saying is not saying he is saying it a few years ago I had a debate and in that debate the person the opponent on the other side hey, how foot by stuck the Shia don't believe in the tahrif, in the interpolation of the Quran so he had a copy of a certain tafsir with him it's a tafsir of Abdullah Shubbar I asked him please may I have that copy he says yes special gift for you have it I take the Quran I take it home that tafsir I take it home I open to the ayah kuntum khayra ummatin and he tells me that no the Ahlul Bayt read this ayah kuntum khayra a immatin ukhrijat linnas you were just telling me now that this is not the case the very book that with your own hand you give me so unfortunately bluster and circumlocution are the kind of problems that we face if we're going to have a Shia sitting in the, uh, next to us right now we've been that route before unfortunately it doesn't. If you really want to, try it out. I have tried it. I don't see how it can work. And as long as atheists can go on teaching theology at university, I think I as a person wala uzaki nafsi but I as a person who has spent something close up to two decades studying Shiism, I think I've got some little kind of right to sit here today. There are a few questions from our sisters. The first is why were the daughters not included under the cloak? The daughters, the other daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa all passed away in his lifetime. By the time the incident of the cloak happened, they had, they had passed away already. And they, none of them left any descendants. Um, so it was only Fatima, the only daughter that was left, the others, the, the first daughter, I think the one passed away already at the time of Al Badr. That was early in the history of the other one passed away not long thereafter, so all of them passed away by that time. The next question was why was it necessary for Sayyidina Ali and Muawiyah to go to battle over the dis disagreement? Um, in our first lesson, I think we made some reference to this, but these historical issues are going to form the topic of an entire separate. The discussion, inshallah, the deliberation in future. We'll get into the details of that. We have a third question from the side of the sisters. How do we ensure that our hadith are authentic? There is a methodology. Those who can study it. Those who know it, apply it. Those who don't know it, ask those who know. Um, Mawla, I just want to mention. I've heard one of the brothers mention that we need to get one of the experts of the Shia here. I think that brothers just need to know that whenever they have a conversion of a member of the Dina Islam, they don't give the experts to read. Why should we invite one of them here? And I think we need to speak to them. Shukran. 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 Shukran for that great minds thing. I like that's exactly what I said last week. <laughs> And is the impression of the lady cycling in the little notes to the front? That's a that comment. Um, I, I'm flabbergasted regarding the comment of we are no war part or I, I don't know, you're not defending yourself, and, and I think if you're not going to say something about it, I'll say something about it because it doesn't mind it. Nobody ever said, not you, and, uh, and there's a quotation coming from somewhere. It says that we are in a war part of somewhere. So you're not going to rectify this now tonight. It will always be there. So I don't know if you are quoted in your sleep or in a dream or 
for some reason, but I think therefore the four five lessons that have been, been going on in no way, if anybody in, from the chair they call for a war or anything like this. I have conferred with you and you know, the man, I've asked my families, they say I don't speak to myself. Any other question? Any other question? Unfortunately, at the time, Chopin, there are two questions, and one coming also. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Please ask. You have the opportunity to ask. I don't know if other people are going to be questioning. No problem. Smith. Well, I said, the, um, you might come in one of your submissions that there are shares that are completely out of the fold, there are some that are perhaps inside the confines of the fold. Is it going to be part of the of the agency's strategy, perhaps long term, to at least for the one the better would be, are we take those that are closer to the Afghanistan, or are we, or is it the strategy then throughout the educational seminars that are being held here to completely outset and never ever have the idea or even the notion to embrace them? And the reason why I'm really asking is we made this, and, and God forbid, Allah must guide this community and this country. If we are not going to have a Pakistan information, if we are not going to have an Iraq information, and sometimes the, and I just want to make one example, that the leaders may be able to have the tenacity and have the willingness to speak to one at perhaps a very high level, maybe at university, maybe at other government slums and other institutions. And the one example that we must for what it's worth is that when Al Hajj Al Malik Shabbat, Bekan Al Malik X, was assassinated by his own so called brethren, and during the investigation, when they questioned Louis Farouk Khan, he said, No, I didn't assassinate him. In later investigation, he said, But maybe my speeches may have incited others and my followers to have done and committed that assassination. I think that's really, really what his passion is about to not and to avoid a similar situation. And again, Allah is Alpha that we have in Pakistan, that we have in Iraq today. So you can hold the Shia who take close and heed what you are saying, so they stop the fabrication of Shia, because there will be no tension. I think Sheikh Al-Fan has encapsulated well already. I will just be reiterating what he has said, but, you know, it's always we have to understand that. It's never the other side. Has anyone taken the trouble to go to uh, the Ahlul Bayt Foundation and ask them that, look, could you stop the propagation? Could you? Why is it that there are so many missions from Iran operating, not only in South Africa, all over the Sunni world? You go to East Africa, you go to West Africa, you go to North Africa, Egypt has a problem. Palestine suddenly a few years ago also had a problem. Bosnia, which never had any Sunni, uh, any Shia, after the war suddenly there was some kind of problem happening there. I think if the slogans of the revolution were true, La Shi'i wa la Sunni, there's no such a thing as a Shi'i, no such a thing as a Sunni, and we are all just brothers and believers. How come the one hand that feeds that slogan, the other hand feeds the other? missions that operate in these countries of ours. Why does it happen? The only reason why we are upset is because we are seeing our own children, our own brothers, our own mothers, fathers, we are seeing them convert to Shiism. And then when we read history, we see that wherever Sunnis and Shias exist together, it has never been free from tension. Who is introducing the tension here? We had enough tension as it is with the moon. We had enough tension as it is with the beef before that. We had enough tension with whatever the issues might be. Was it necessary for the Shia to come propagating? If a person today goes to uh, the Ahlul Bayt Foundation and says, I want to become a Shi'i, and they tell him, brother, you're a Sunni, you're a Muslim, you don't need to become a Shi'i. Then would they have had a few hundred adherents today? But they haven't been doing that. Any new one comes, they will convert him. They will convert him. There is an imbalance that's been created. That imbalance wasn't created, wasn't created by Sheikh Irfan. That wasn't created by the MJC. The MJC was prepared to embrace once upon a time. Like the International Union of 
scholars of ulama was prepared to embrace until they found that while we are embracing propagation and proselytization and conversions are going on so that is where the balance is being upset we are responding today we are responding because exactly the reasons that you are outlining there it's in no one's interest that Shiism spreads this audio is brought to you by Muslim Central please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate Mm-hmm.